Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001 when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India an Indian perspective on Africa given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy because we are a think tank and being close to policy, commenting on policy, and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now, this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I, for many years, have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program, which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries, and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics, but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal, India Quarterly, is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future.
ओके ओके आई गो है गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन माई नेम इज प्रियंका पंडित आई एम अ रिसर्च फेलो एट द इंडियन काउंसिल ऑफ वर्ल्ड अफेयर्स न्यू डेली इट गिव्स मी ग्रेट प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल टू द आई सी डब्ल्यू ए वेबिन आर ऑन रीमेजिनिंग द ग्लोबल हेल्थ एजेंडा वॉट रोल कैन इंडिया प्ले कोविड नाइन्टीन हैज पोस्ट एन अनप्रेसिडेंटेड थ्रेट टू ह्यूमैनिटी इट इज द फर्स्ट पैंडमिक टू हैव स्ट्रक अ थरली इंटीग्रेटेड ग्लोबल इकोनॉमी द फॉल आउट इज जस्ट नॉट स्लम्पिंग डिमांड बट इन अब्रप्ट एंड रैपिड शिफ्ट in our production and consumption activities from a perspective of global health governance it has called for a collective response from actors at multiple levels in particular the pandemic has put a sharp focus on the world health organization the lead un agency responsible for global health care management in today's webinar we are going to discuss some of the issues surrounding the who how the global health governance is going to evolve post covid and what role can india play in bringing about the changes especially at the normative and at the structural level i would also like to take this opportunity to bring to your attention a series of publications by the icwa research fellows on and around covid-19 which can be accessed on our website www.icwa.in today we have with us three very distinguished panelists ambassador manjeev singh puri Ambassador Puri is former Deputy Permanent Representative of India to the United Nations and former Indian Ambassador to Nepal, European Union, Belgium and Luxembourg. He was a lead negotiator in India's delegation for the UN Conference on Sustainable Development held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in June 2012. Dr. Devi Shetty, Dr. Shetty is a cardiac surgeon and the chairman of Narayana Health. He is the recipient of a number of awards and honors including the prestigious Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan award in 2003 and 2012 respectively conferred by the government of India and the Rajyotsava award in 2002 conferred by the government of Karnataka Professor Smita Srinivas Professor Srinivas is the founder director of the Technological Change Lab TC Lab an economics and development research platform she is currently professorial research fellow at the Open University UK and visiting professor at the National Center for Biological Sciences TIFR she holds phd from mit and her book market miniaturee health and development in late industrial states published by stanford university press in 2012 won the biennial eaep middle prize today's webinar will be moderated by ms indrani bakchi ms bakchi is a senior diplomatic editor with the times of india She was a Reuters Fellow at Oxford University and was awarded the Changlin Tian Fellowship by the Asia Foundation to study U.S.-China relations at Brookings Institution, Washington D.C. Before I request Ms. Bakshi to conduct today's proceedings, few housekeeping rules: questions can be asked live by typing in the chat box. Moderator will try and take all questions, which our panelists will respond during the Q&A session. You are requested to keep your questions clear and brief. Uh, I now request Ms. Bakshi to kindly take over. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, the topic, as you uh, realize, is extremely uh, is extremely important, uh, very proximate to our lives. As you see, we are all in lockdown situations, um, and uh, uh, what seems to me. uh looking from the point of view of someone who covers politics and diplomacy is uh, how health has now become a strategic issue uh it's a strategic issue for uh, not just for india but for the rest of the world and i think it goes well beyond the who um we are looking at another world uh when we emerge from this lockdown uh, another world when we emerge from this pandemic uh the questions that we should be asking ourselves Uh, is um, how do we? What does the new uh, world? What does the health agenda for the new world look like? And uh, today, I think we will not only look at what the future of the WHO is. Um, I would urge you to refer to the Prime Minister's uh, statement at the G20 summit, virtual summit, where he said that uh, we would like to see the WHO reformed. Uh, what would a reformed WHO look like? um but also what are the questions that uh the global health agenda should be looking for uh for instance and that would incorporate some of the learning uh from the current pandemic uh for instance how do we recognize what are the 
signs of an early recognition of an epidemic. And I think we have, uh, there has been definite failure on this count uh, for the current pandemic. Um, what are the, uh, should there be international protocols that kick in uh, when a pan an epidemic of a uh, large proportion uh, actually unfolds? Um, how do we build uh, how do we build systems or um, that that prevent us from stigmatizing countries uh, that begin where an epidemic of this kind begins? Uh, and I say this because uh, we have we really don't know why China uh, did not inform uh, the rest of the world. Uh, or sat on its information uh, for the first couple of weeks, which uh, had uh, effects that we all know about. Uh, but does stigma, does, does a stigma um, uh, form a part of it? How do we, wh what, what do we do when countries or societies hide the symptoms? I, is there an international, uh, can there be an international uh, system or uh, protocol that, kick, that look at these uh, symptoms and go beyond a country, sort of overcome a country's own uh, decision? Is there, should that be the case? Or should we let sovereignty uh, take the decision? Uh, when we have so much of privatized healthcare in the world, um, how do they plug in? to a global health agenda uh, for not only the country concerned, but for the rest of the world. Um, and lastly, I would say, uh, you know, just as we have, uh, we, are, we build our strategic petroleum reserve, uh, is, there, is this a time for us to build some kind of a pharmaceutical reserve that we can uh, help each other with um, during times of an epidemic. And I will throw open these questions and any more that will come up uh, to our eminent panel. Uh, may I call upon Ambassador Manjeev Puri to uh, take the floor and um, start his initial remarks? Uh, Indrani, thank you very much. Uh, at the outset, you know, please allow me to thank uh, ICWA, Priyanka, and the Director General, Mr. Raghavan, to give me this opportunity to be in this very distinguished panel. Uh, Dr. Shetty, you are, of course, one of the great guys of our times. So, you know, what a pleasure. And Dr. Shreva, a pleasure getting to know you. Indrani is an old friend of mine. Look, uh, normally speaking, I would have thought that when we are talking about reimagining the global agenda and our role for India in it, we would have started with what I believe are the most important. What can a country which houses one-sixth of humanity do by itself for itself, because this is what the world learns, sees and says, hey, you can do it yourself, great. So let me point out something to you right at the beginning. The fact that today we have about 30,000 cases and less than a thousand deaths is not going unnoticed by the world. If this number had been dramatically different or had it been along the lines of what is happening in the United States, can you imagine what kind of numbers are we looking for? And this is what perhaps is giving us the chance to even talk about this particular subject that we are today pontificating. on. Therefore, let me make this point to you, although I need to speak more on the external agenda, let me make this point to you. What, according to me, are essential issues on the domestic side, I leave it to our friends from the medical fraternity, Dr. Shetty and others to say, but I will agree with you very strongly, uh, Indrani, that we need to look at the infrastructure whether it's ventilators, whether, whether it's vaccine production, whether it is to be able to lay out hospital beds, testing kits, you know, frankly, we really didn't have any of them around in adequate numbers here itself. So I think that is particularly important. But I want to leave one thought with you, um, which I believe has not really been focused even in the public domain. If I'm not mistaken, we really have just one or two national virology institutes. And are they really doing research in terms of serum development, in terms of vaccines? Aren't we so proud when we hear the Serum Institute's name being touted in every newspaper and everywhere in the world as the partner with the Oxfordian team, which is possibly going to find a breakthrough for us? And yet, why haven't we really had even sets of institutes? 
Now, I did some little bit of research and I found that in 2013-14, we had uh, uh, agreed to set up regional and many, many uh, these kind of virology institutes. I don't think we've done anything on them. Our emphasis in the medical field remains produce doctors. I think we need to now understand this. So this is just one thought I'm leaving for you. I'm also leaving this thought because to me it is a segue to get into what I think has been an area where pharmaceuticals have been guided overwhelmingly by the profit motive. You know, let's remember the ideas of coming together on global health started at the same time as Jenner and Pasteur and everybody started making their discoveries as the companies on the Rhine started producing chemicals and the whole idea of IPR became so very big. Now, therefore, when the WHO was formed, its basic ideas were health and let me tell you it left out medicine and I'll give you one little example. The European Union doesn't have a common health policy, but it has a very strong organization called the European Medicines uh, Organization based in London, which actually, you know, is the super king of all the testing, the IPRs, etc. on all sorts of medical formulations, etc. that you tend to see. So I'm just driving home this little point between producing medical professionals and doing all this work. You know, in the field of agriculture, Perhaps in that beautiful moment after the Second World War, when the world was a little bit more generous, the World Bank funded the setting up of the CGIAR system, which is a series of agricultural labs, which in their work have resulted in the Green Revolution, have resulted in the Rice Revolution and so on and so forth. We haven't seen anything like this in the area of pharmaceutical vaccines. Of course, the main reason has been because the profit motive was so established in the area of medicines and so on. But can we do something? COVID-19, let me tell you, is in our age of today, a time of social media, far greater awakening. And this lockdown, which has been happened all over the world, is perhaps the first time this kind of a response to pandemic, which has been viewed and noted by people across the world, has taken place. Can we look at doing something in terms of pooling our resources for global research on virology and whatever else goes with it, but basically let me say antidote production. And can we make it such that we can share the IPRs or can it be a case of some kind of, let me say, affordable IPR access? You know, when we talk about the previous kinds of things that happened, the great TRIPS agreement, for example, at the WTO, it's all about affordability. It was all about trying to get things to others. It hasn't been such a great success. I mean, let me tell you when we had this bird flu and everybody thought Tammy flu, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, that's Roche's product, uh, should be, you know, compulsory licensing should be done. They resisted. The big boys in the world all resisted with them. And it took several years for CIPLA to get a Supreme Court of India decision that, yes, you can produce uh, generics of this Tammy flu. By then it was, of course, too late. Now let me turn to a few things, you know, because time is limited on what can be done in terms of institutional arrangements in the world. Let me first tell you this, the WHO did not come out of any kind of great idea which was there in 1948 when it was finally set up or 1945 when the first resolution was adopted in the ECOSOC. No, it came about as a result of a series of actions from 1851, things called International Sanitary Conferences and Raghavan, thank you for pointing that out to us which were held basically to find quarantine standards for cholera. Then later on, you know, plague and so on and so forth and several other things. And you had an organization under the League of Nations as well as a parallel organization called the International Office of Public Health in Paris. So there is a whole history behind why all of this has come about. And this is also at a time when multilateralism, as we currently know it, was almost non-existent prior to the League of Nations. So the idea of international cooperation has been recognized and there's a good reason. We don't need to rediscover this wheel. Let us therefore build on it and that continues to remain my biggest area of action. Now, what is it that I'm going to propose? I plan to propose two simple ideas, two straightforward ideas. And these are ideas also driven by one simple fact, my country, India. 
The Honorable Prime Minister, speaking to the G20 leaders, spoke about a reform of the WHO. Of course, in this particular time, that really makes sense because there's no doubt that whether it was the Chinese who didn't want the world to know, whether it is because of stigma, whether it is whatever it is, this thing came from some long laboratory or they didn't do anything after the SARS epidemic of shutting the wet markets. Let's forget all that. But the fact of the matter remains that the WHO has allowed itself to get into a situation where people can take pot shots at it. It did not, uh, for example, ring the bell early enough. Could it have? I don't know. Let me tell you, there is, it isn't such a simple matter. I think most of you would know that at least my own personal experience, the European Center for Disease Control in Stockholm does the same things which have appeared in the Guardian's uh, article the other day that the WHO has a global sort of a situation room where they monitor every day. The Europeans do it themselves. I have personally been invited and have heard. The CDC does it itself. So obviously there has been some kind of a global failure in recognizing etc. But it has to, you know, the can has to fall somewhere and that's the WHO. What can we do about it? I have given this some thought and my own understanding is that Contrary to what many people say, this thing called depoliticization, that has not helped. The WHO, etc. have in a sense depoliticized themselves. The members' contribution to their budget is very small. Voluntary contributions make up everything. And voluntary contributions, let me assure you, they come with their own skewed agendas, which are not wrong. They are, they are genuine, decent agendas. But they have a certain degree of skewing. The executive board of the World Health Organization meets twice a year, wants to set the agenda for the World Health Assembly, which is usually held in May. I don't know when it will be held this year and the other time to take some wrap over kind of session. I believe that it would be extremely useful that we use this pandemic to bring about one change. And let me for the sake of wanting to coin a phrase, let me say we set up the World Health Council. We get rid of this executive body, this executive board, we call it the World Health Council, more in keeping with today's action oriented bodies. We did this, for example, with the Human Rights Commission, replaced it by the Human Rights Council. It should be a smaller body than the current 34. And I believe it is very, very essential that other than regional representation, you do have representation from a, at least five or six countries that matter the most for global health. Yes, I'm going to stop right now in a, in a minute. This is one idea. My second idea is that we talk in terms of mandatory reporting. I think the International Health Regulations 2005-7, they left much of this to open. We need to move into a much more mandatory reporting regime. Whether we can enforce it or not, that I don't know. And now Indrani, right at the end, let me tell you. You know, these are global organizations. They have come about basically as a result of a degrees of compromises getting together. I'm afraid the director general of the WHO has just taken a far too much and it has happened on his watch. I don't want to go into the fact whether he was responsible or he wasn't, but it's happened on his watch. Somebody really needs to take the sort of blame for it. Let us remember this is election year in the United States. Let us also remember what else is happening in the global uh, political scene all over the world. My own idea is the gentleman must go and this is something that we need to see if we can work with the Africans to see his replacement. Remember, this has happened in earlier UN organizations, whether it's Butros, Ghali or anywhere else. We in India, I think, have a unique opportunity. Our Prime Minister's personal stature, our membership of the G20, our having articulated it, the relatively good work that we've done in combating COVID. Can we get together talk to the people and have these decisions taken because I think the WHO matters more than the personality of the person who's currently the Director General. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manjeev. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Shetty, uh, you have been introduced, although you need absolutely no introduction. And may I say as a fan who once in many, many years interviewed you in Calcutta, uh, love to hear your thoughts on the subject. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> can you hear me, Indrani? Yes, I can. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, 
I would like to present my uh, opinion as a jumbled up series of thoughts rather than a well orchestrated organized presentation. Please forgive me, but I'll try to bring as much data and the facts as possible. The first observation I have about whatever is happening in this world is that <clears throat> one decision by the government uh, of early clamping at the lockdown and extension of the lockdown. My assessment, it is a, it is a assumption or a guess is that mortality following COVID uh, will come down by at least 50%. At least 50%. This is my assessment. If you ask me, do I have any scientific data? I don't have, but this is my assessment based on what happened in other parts of the world. Now, everyone predicted doomsday, including me, saying that we virus will behave the same way like it behaved in US and Europe and human beings also will behave the same way. So there is going to be a disaster in, going to happen mainly because of our poor healthcare infrastructure in India. But contrary to all our predictions, everything, everything just turned upside down to India's favor. Now, if it was a disaster in terms of huge number of patients coming, we would have had a serious, serious problem. Why? Because I just want to compare two countries. Look at the mortality in Germany and look at the mortality in Italy. Uh, it is huge, huge, vastly different. The reason is uh, Germany has 29 ICU beds for one lakh population and Italy has, if I'm not mistaken, about 12 beds uh, per 1 lakh population. Germany has one of the largest number of ICU beds. When I talk about ICU bed, it's not just about beds. It is the doctors, nurses, technicians, and the entire support. Uh, London, the, the National Health Service has about seven beds. And India claims to have about two beds per 1 lakh population, but I think we have less than one bed. Now, other interesting observation you all would have noticed reading the media, the or media reports, where all the COVID patients are getting treated. They are not getting treated in any of the corporate hospitals. They are all getting treated in the public hospital, government hospital. So, if we want a, a healthy nation, we have to make government hospitals vibrant. Irrespective of how much private hospital like mine try to reduce the cost of healthcare, there is no way we will be able to offer healthcare for more than 20%, 30% of the country's population. 60 to 70% of the population are dependent on the government hospital. And they will continue to depend on the government hospital. So if you want a better healthcare for the nation, we have to make government hospitals more vibrant. Are they vibrant today? No, certainly not. When I was a kid, when I needed a tonsillectomy, my father got my tonsillectomy done in a government hospital. Because he, I'm sure he could afford to take me any, to any hospital, but he decided to get it in a government hospital. Today, how many of you or people known to you in your friend circle ever visit a government hospital? Why? The reason, there is only one reason. The reason is shortage of medical specialists in government hospital is 80%. Virtually, there are no specialists in the government hospital. Concept of hospital has changed dramatically today, unlike in the past. In the past, doctor saw the patient, he saw the reports, and he advised some treatment on a piece of paper. Today, when we talk about a hospital, we are talking about an intervention. We are talking about an ultrasound, or a CT scan, or an MRI, or a procedure like endoscopy, or an operation. 
that is a whole meaning of uh, hospital otherwise most of the treatment can be offered uh, on a telephone so this is where we have failed unless we and the bad reputation private hospital are getting today in the media is not because private hospitals are doing a bad job a person who cannot afford the private hospital is pushed to go to the private hospital because the government hospital is not offering him the care he wants he sells his house at the end stage of the disease goes to the government hospital uh, sorry private hospital spends one or two lakh rupees of his life saving and the patient dies obviously he is upset and we get all the blame so if you want to see a better future for this country a vibrant healthcare delivery we have to insist on making government hospital vibrant now why this is not happening this is not happening because of the failure of the medical educational system when i was a young medical student all my classmates were the children of teachers government employees and civil servants and the uh, uh, farmers and regular people today children from poor families top dreaming of becoming doctors because medical education has become an elitist affair it costs now 500 crore rupees to set up a medical college 500 crore rupees and with that kind of investment governments cannot set up a medical college is it really required to spend 500 crore rupees for a medical college it is not required there are medical colleges in caribbean i can buy one of those medical colleges for 2 million dollars and these medical colleges train doctors for united states over 30% of the doctors practicing in us come from the caribbean medical colleges now why have they kept it so expensive because there is the medical education has become a very 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 profitable and very very expensive affair so the unless you if you produce large number of doctors then the value of the degree will go down so if you want to say that md radiology value of a pgc it is say 4 crore rupees why will anybody pay 4 crore rupees for a pgc if that is available uh, for virtually free or maybe for 10000 or you know 1 lakh or 2 lakh rupees so only way is keeping the shortage now what is the implication of shortage for one month continuously in all the tv debates media debates we heard about ventilator country has now today even a kid going to school knows india has only 30 40000 ventilators nobody even by mistake asked a question how many ventil how many anesthesiologists are there in the country who can connect a covid patient to a ventilator nobody has asked we are in the process of buying 50000 ventilators all the government agencies come forward even private sector has ordered for more ventilators in the country today there are only 40000 anesthetists who can connect the covid patient to a ventilator but half of them are more than 50 they will not touch the uh, covid patient because it's too risky for them to do it because that is a very risky procedure for the doctor when you are intubating a patient with covid that means you are left with 20000 doctors and all most of these 20000 doctors are all living in the city and 60% of the country's population live in villages and there are there are 740 or district hospitals where covid patients are supposed to be treated they may not even have one anesthetist forget about having 100 200 icu beds with the, you know over 100 skilled workforce but believe me it is a government and the god has saved us at least for the time being let's keep our fingers crossed so the essentially why this is happening this is happening because 
organizations which are supposed to protect the the organizations which which are supposed to protect the lives of the citizens the 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 custodians of healthcare have not asked the right questions from the bodies which are involved in medical education we never asked and the privileged society which had the knowledge didn't bother asking the question because privileged society can always access private healthcare if today in this country you ask any of the policy makers how many anesthetists are there in the country nobody knows how many cardiologists are there in the country nobody knows how many gynecologists are there nobody knows we have the anecdotal evidence of how many doctors are practicing based on the membership of these associations which is up to them a doctor can become a member of association or not it's up to him so essentially we have uh, created a system which is not accountable and no one asks the questions so the it is not only in india you go to african there are countries in africa they get millions of pounds or dollars pounds as a international aid for uplifting the healthcare nobody writing a check ask them how many pediatricians are there in your country how many gynaco so far no international body ever asked a country what is the requirement of a gynecologist in your country what is the requirement of a pediatrician in your country nobody asked now is it a rocket science to become a doctor art of healing is innate to all of us when god gives us brings us to this world he has given the attitude of compassion caring and taking care of someone else that's why he has given us two hands the, the so essentially we have the innate skill it is very easy to make somebody with the passion as a doctor but the agencies which are supposed to credit give us the credentials utilize this opportunity to convert it like a uh, 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 engine which can generate huge amount of uh, you know whatever the uh, the profit or whatever you call it now is it only to the medical education no nursing education is the same the essentially we have we require at least 3 to 4 million nurses so we hardly have 1 to 100 not even 1 and a half million nurses what is required so the in india when we plan our healthcare uh, strategy we can't be looking at what is the in india's requirement we should be looking at the global requirement because we have the brand as a uh, country of producing doctors which are recognized all over the world now th there are uh, there are research paper published by harvard business school which shows that uh, americans who are treated by expat doctors mainly from india live longer than the americans who are treated by american doctors so essentially we are the uh, uh, we have the brand and the world is looking at us but unfortunately we are not able to produce that many doctors so coming back to the other issues about the uh, ventilator or medical equipment why we are not able to deliver or produce them the reason is any medical equipment requires certification and we do not have a international body to certify so we look at if i produce a ventilator in india i can only get it certified by us fda or ce so without those agencies i cannot even sell it in my own country because our own doctors won't buy it now why will uh, us fda approve my company's product when i am the largest buyer of their machines so several times we try to bring african countries asian countries and india together to have a international body and all those countries were desperate for india to take the leadership in creating a certifying body for the medical equipments but unfortunately there was a lukewarm response from india so time has come for us to create that bodies so the uh, the uh, the, the uh, essentially uh, we have a great opportunity in india to use healthcare as a in, uh, as a a uh, revenue generating a uh, specialty wherein we can easily earn 100 billion dollars a year just by training 
5 million doctors, nurses and medical technicians. This can be a very large revenue generator for us. All we need is 5, 5 million of these doctors. I'll give an example. Cuba sends about 40,000 doctors, nurses, technicians to Latin American countries and earns about 8 to 9 billion dollars of foreign currency revenue, which is about 30% of their foreign currency earning. Uh, Philippines earns 37 billion dollars of revenue every year by exporting doctors, nurses and technicians to uh, and of course the maids and others to the uh, rest of the world. So essentially a country which produces 26 million uh, babies a year, we simply do not have the resources to give employment to all of them, a meaningful, well-paying job. But today, if we can create, convert all the 740 district hospitals by investing about 50 crore rupees, convert them as a medical college hospital, nursing college with a paramedical education, we will be able to produce enough number of doctors to take care of our own health and the rest of the world. So the, this is not the last time we are having uh, a epidemic. Thanks. Yeah, this is not the last time we will have this type of epidemic happening very often because I don't want to get in the debate as is it a man-made virus or a, a the, the natural virus. Now, there are many countries in the world which simply cannot keep reserve of doctors, nurses and technicians in case of a calamity like this in the future. Whereas India is in a position to create a reserve of healthcare workforce for the whole world. And we have a great, great opportunity. And my dream is that whenever there is a natural catastrophe in any part of the world, first thing you look at is the Cuban doctors presenting there to, uh, for the rescue operation. Can it be Indian doctors? And we have a great opportunity. And thank you very much for the uh, uh, opportunity for me to interact with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shetty. Uh, Dr. Srinivas, uh, may I call on you now? Yeah. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, yes, I'm going yes. to share a screen because I want to uh, build on some of the discussions uh, that are already in place. And I think it would help to provide a little bit of maybe looking back and looking forward. Um, as um, we've already heard, we're going to come out of this uh, pandemic eventually. And this will neither be the first nor the last we visit, hopefully not many more in our lifetimes. But nevertheless, there's something to be learned. Um, so I'm going to share my screen uh, for those of you in the audience, especially students who might be there. Uh, you might find it useful um, to uh, take a look at the arguments. And I'm happy to have a uh, pushback. Let's see if I can do this. Um, how do I, let's see if I can start sharing. Can everyone see this? No. Uh, Any luck? Uh, no. Yes. Okay. So um, I want to start here because uh, in a way I want to return to what Ms. Bachi has asked us, which is what is the relationship to the WHO as it stands? How do we think about the pandemic and India's role? Um, and I am currently part of uh, several collaborations. One of them uh, is the Innovations for Cancer Care in Africa, where there are four countries involved, um, and we're really focused on the question of local production and innovation. Uh, why this is important uh, will become clear in a second. Um, and that's partly because there are many, many good examples coming from India of lessons uh, not just for the world, but also for India in its global role. Um, one item that you may want to see here is the National Cancer Grid, where we have a, a multilateral role to play. And the second is really India's wider generics uh, and pharmaceutical supplier to the world um, status. In addition, uh, you're seeing in the context of COVID uh, considerable um, 
dynamism associated with the debate around diagnostic kits, uh, vaccines, and so on. So uh, two books. Uh, one, of course, is mine. I'll refer to it. But there's another one which is extremely interesting, and I would urge all of you to look at closely. It's called Making Medicines in Africa, and it's listed here. It comes out uh, from uh, colleagues in our project, and it takes a very strong look at some of the challenges of both the current multilateralism and the context in which local production and innovation play a role. Now, what kind of um, um, sort of expertise is involved here? Let's be specific. When we talk about multilateralism, we're not referring to um, sort of altruism, feel good, uh, collaboration, all of the global south together. We are using very specific industrial policy and technology instruments which define whether or not we are able to develop diagnostic kits, whether we can export them to certain certification requirements, whether we can develop procurement systems that buy what we need when, uh, whether we have, as uh, Ambassador Puri has mentioned, uh, the question of uh, the Doha round to serve us. So there is a tense question associated with industrial policy and technology instruments about what we can do when we need and how we need it. Much of our response in the current COVID environment has been a question of whether our health industry and our health systems work in conjunction together, and it remains to be seen how we proceed in the coming uh, weeks. But one thing that has become very clear is whether it is this pandemic or previous ones, countries that do not have local production capabilities of their own struggle in environment of health security. And this matters not just for strategic multilateral relations, but of course in the context of whether they can provide timely and effective health um, care for their own populations. So really two arguments here. One is that the existing multilateral system comes out of a very uneven industrial ambition built on certain premises of technological capabilities and has presumed in the last 50 years a great deal of rhetoric around convergence through manufacturing value addition. Similarly, the second argument is that glo the global health industry is really a strategic arena. Of course, there are global benefits, but the country differences, especially related to the first point, their local industrial capabilities, their technological advances, these are poorly understood and studied. And in our team and others, we have made quite a lot of advance on this front to understand what it is that makes India's response in context, whether it's diagnostic kits, whether it's vaccines, whether it's uh, nursing professions and so on, uh, whether we are able to really augment the health system within the context of industrial capabilities. Another way to say what I have just said is to say that the WHO has thought of itself or has projected itself as a health governance and health systems uh, actor. I would argue that one of the big missing elements is that the WHO seems either to not recognize or unwittingly or unwillingly not recognize that they actually oversee an industrial organization of health. They cannot actually help us with procurement, uh, with advanced uh, technology response systems, or even collaboration agreements, because much of the technology and industrial data within this governance system is actually administered through some of the policy instruments that I mentioned, and many of those are not shared multilaterally. Just to speed this through, we know this picture, which is the non-aligned movement, and while there were, of course, quite idealistic principles espoused, I have argued that, in fact, there is no shared agenda on the global south in economic development. So if we view the industrial elements, whatever we may think of them, of health systems, there is no clear shared agenda amongst countries. Either we subsume the industrial agenda, 
under health sovereignty and health security. Or sorry, but the slides are not moving. I am stuck. Yeah, the slides are not moving. How do yeah. I change the slides? Shall I just go ahead? Just control F. Control F. Full screen, I think that will be five. F five. F5. Yes, I hear you. I'm just trying to do it while we. Can you see it? No, no. My slide is still stuck in slide number one. I'm in very interested one? in the slides. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll I'll continue with the argument, and then we can return to um, the issue. I don't want to um, slow the load the discussion um, at this point. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. So in the context of the non-aligned movement, what we saw was at least a rhetoric associated with the industrial organization and the need for building a post-colonial, post, um, a new national agenda around technology and industry. What I have argued in, in uh, recent publications is that whether that rhetoric was justified or not, the reality is that a variety of clubs, different blocks around membership, G77, G20, OECD, ASEAN, BRICS, you name it, have all proliferated with a very mixed agenda within which India fits. And Rather than see the problem as one of convergence in which multilateralism will somehow help us, I would argue, in fact, that there are four C's in which we need to think about this issue. One has to do with convergence, which is a way of thinking about a shared agenda around manufacturing value addition, problems associated with um, convergence around health capabilities or other industrial capabilities in which we build uh, the technological uh, prowess to deal with many of our issues. But the other problem, um, and really the other three Cs, um, have to do with um, cohesion, whether our own industrial and health systems can work together. This is a fundamental issue. I think it has been addressed briefly a little bit by Dr. Shetty. But there's a further two Cs. One is customization. Are we able to actually solve problems in quite localized and effective ways? And the, the fourth C is cognition. Whose problem? Who solves it? How are these solved? Can, in fact, uh, Indians working on Indian problems propose new solutions? Uh, that we have not otherwise seen. Multilateralism, as we understand it currently, focuses on a type of promise of convergence and sharing. And I would argue that these other Cs, convergence alone won't help us. Cohesion, customization, and cognition make a difference. In fact, the data shows quite clearly that the dominant way in which the health industry both of India and many developing countries have evolved, is a great policy push, even international funding assistance, to problems which are really suitable or solutions have been found for advanced industrialized countries and have been mildly adapted for developing countries. On the other hand, solutions that are predominantly suited for developing countries, which might have global markets, or global import in other large dimensions, products, processes, techniques, these have actually not received a lot of attention. So in the make versus buy discussion of multilateralism, a lot of industrializing countries are effectively told to buy, and we are not entirely sure what to do with your make proposal. Is health a strategic issue? Absolutely. In fact, in some of my writing and those with which many of our colleagues are working, industrial production is only one piece of the health system. In fact, provision which, and delivery, which needs the clinics, the hospitals, the personnel, but also the consumption and 
the buying instruments having to do with insurance, with procurement, and so on, are also pivotal pieces of the health system. So while we have given much impetus to the health industry, important though it is, it is part of a health system. The multilateral governance system of the WHO is quite unable to deal with the industrial production and the industrial organization side. And in so doing, uh, we may have quite a utopian view of how to think about examples such as Cuba or Brazil, or to contrast ourselves incorrectly perhaps with a Germany or a, or a US. If we actually look at what I have called an in, in institutional triad of production, consumption, and delivery instruments, which you could think of in terms of the services realm, we have very cautious comparisons to make and a very ambitious role, in fact, for India in the frameworks going ahead. If we look across history, in fact, very few countries, Japan amongst them, have made an attempt to try and juggle all three in a mostly democratic process. India has tried and succeeded in a very mixed way. But if we look at the three pivots of one, two, three of production, demand, and delivery, we are likely to actually make much more cautious comparisons and also think differently about our multilateral allies going forward. Um, I'm going to try one last time to share the screen, um, but otherwise I'm just going to proceed forward. Yeah. So really uh, to, and to recap, um, the two arguments are as follows, uh, and keeping um, time, time in mind. Yeah. One is that the existing multilateral system is really fundamentally tied um, to a global skew in the benefits given on industrial ambitions and technological capabilities. The economics advisory, the financing, the block voting challenges, the record on autonomy and local production is quite poor. Secondly, if indeed the global health industry or our national health systems are strategic arenas, then we have to think very critically about what role India wants to take in combining its health industry and embedding it within a much more vibrant health system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Srinivas. Uh, yes, that would be, yeah, be nice to go back to seeing everybody. Yeah. Um, right. Thank you very much for those lovely, fabulous presentations and much food for thought. Uh, we do have a bunch of questions uh, already. I am going to begin uh, with one question for, uh, with a couple of questions for Ambassador Puri and uh, a bunch of questions for Dr. Shetty. Uh, uh, so, Ambassador Puri, uh, do you think uh, India would, um, uh, uh, but I think you've already answered this. Uh, the question is, would you, would, should India back uh, the WHO DG Tedros uh, for a second term? Uh, or how should we, how, or how should we uh, go about that? Um, the second is, um, uh, on you know mental health care, uh, which has come up several times during this particular uh, pandemic, and especially during this particular lockdown. Uh, a second question to you, uh, Ambassador Puri, is uh, there is now where did that go? Uh, yes, um, on uh, working with Africa. Uh, on uh, WHO reform. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave you to think about your answers while I tell Dr. Shetty his, and yet, Dr. Shetty, you have to prepare yourself. You've got a whole lot of questions. Uh, on, um, on robust healthcare delivery, uh, can governments legislate self-activating clusters of local government primary health centers with defined autonomy to respond to outbreaks, uh, that's one. Second, um, the high cost of medical colleges in India 
um, and this is from Dr. Uh, from T. C. A. Raghavan. Um, is this because of some regulatory fact factors that uh, are required in terms of infrastructure? Is that leading to higher costs? Um, third, uh, should India legislate a targeted national zone-wise silos of pharmaceutical ingredients to address the position of attaining autonomy in generic production? And I would like uh, both uh, you, Dr. Shetty, and Dr. Srinivas uh, to address uh, these questions. Uh, let's just begin with these for the time being and uh, move on uh, subsequently. So Manjeev, would you like to uh, take on the first couple of questions? Uh, Indrani, thank you very much. So I, you know, want to go from the simple perspective of one particular factor. If I may use this Churchillian expression, why waste a crisis? Look, India has been for now many years trying to see if we could go somewhat up the table of high table of global governance. We were not born with this privilege. We happen to be then a colony, etc., etc. These are opportunities. Some opportunities come purely because you are a great growing economy. Today, the third largest or the fifth largest in the world, growing up several notches. Some you have to take advantage of situations as they come about. I think the COVID epidemic is one of them where we can try and do a little bit of positioning for ourselves on the global high table and to start with the WHO. Now, let me make a simple point on WHO. Look, whether we like it or not, there are very few people who are in a position to defend the WHO, even though many would agree that the organization was hamstrung. Similarly, the director general, I'm afraid he just becomes the fall guy in this particular game. Who are the protagonists? The United States of America. Let me tell you, this is an election year. It is a very tough game which is going on there. You need to understand that you can't have an approach where you leave them out and say, we'll work with the rest of the world. It's not happening. The Chinese may have achieved whatever else, but there's a degree of being chastised. That is something we need to understand. Why do we have to work with the Africans? Because, you know, you need to gently get them around to saying maybe another African to replace Dr. Ted Ross. I'm afraid that's the way these things happen. Don't they happen in our own setup, in our own private affairs, when it happens between you and your companies? The global world is also, in that sense, somewhat similar. So I am very clear in my mind. India has a unique opportunity through a variety of things that has happened to play a role in terms of reform at the WHO. The reform at the moment, as I said, is about one simple strategic thing. I believe, of course, you need to change its governance structures. You need to have countries like India on it in a permanent manner, along with the United States, etc. And I think we need to do something about what Dr. Srinivas has been speaking about, which is the global production of all the things that you require for better health care. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Puri. Uh, Dr. Shetty, would you like to uh, take a shot at uh, the questions addressed to you? I have to say that there are many more addressed to you, but maybe we can just begin with a few. I think you're you're muted, Dr. Shetty. You need to unmute your screen. Uh, I think the question about I think Mr. Raghavan asked the question about the cost of medical education or building okay. a medical college of uh, you know uh, nearing a hundred million dollars. So the this is uh, totally uh, uh, totally uh, uh, the unnecessary. Like a medical college requires 20 acres of land. Nowhere in the world there is a stipulation about the land. I was involved in teaching at the Guy's Hospital Medical School. It was in a hardly uh, half an acre of land. So the uh, essentially medical college requires a big hospital, which is very busy with all the specialists. And then you need few classrooms. So essentially virtually any, medic any hospital with over 300, 400 beds, can be easily converted like a medical college with a little bit of addition. Now, if you do that, entire industry of medical education will collapse because most of the medical colleges which have come up recently, they were all built on a lot of borrowed money as well. 
So, you know, you have a very major question about, you know, how, what do you do? Like a simple example, there are 50,000 to about 70, 60,000 medical seats, so-called medical seats, in about, uh, I think, about 500 to 600 medical colleges. Now, we can double the number of medical colleges if we say that each medical college, first of all, each medical college has enough faculty run three medical colleges. If you take the parameters of US and Europe, you don't need that many faculty members. But we have that many faculty members for whatever reason. Uh, so what we if we can say that each medical college should convert one district hospital as a medical college hospital and preclinical that is anatomy physiology biochemistry happens in the campus of the medical college for clinicals they go to the district hospital then two things will be uh, achieved one is you have changed the profile of healthcare of the entire district by having a medical college hospital there because the moment you say medical college hospital there are the doctors specialists nurses everyone what is required it is there and you will entice the local young uh, boys and girls to become doctors because some preference can be given uh, uh, for the locals. Because if a kid from Agartala comes to Bangalore to become a doctor, studies in one of the Bangalore medical colleges, I can tell you that 95% possibility he will never go back to Agartala. As if a medical college comes up in Agartala itself, uh, most of the kids who join the medical college they become doctors and they're all local kids and most of them may leave Agartala, but 5% of them will stay back. And that is more than sufficient for uplifting the healthcare of Agartala. And that can be done with the zero investment from the point of view of the government. You don't need to build, spend 400 crore to build a medical college in this hospital. It can be done. The question is whether we want to, whether we want to disrupt the that ecosystem which is paying itself so the unfortunately uh, the the you know the it is not a very easy animal to handle so i don't want to get into the details yeah what's the next question uh, uh, this yeah oh yeah uh, well uh, there is another one that says uh, that we we india has a number of uh, students uh, who come back from foreign countries uh, with a medical degree, uh, yet they and they cannot practice here, of course. Uh, and I suspect it's la lack of stand standardization, etc. How would you put them to use? Is there? Do you have a way of putting them to use? See, the most of the uh, kids who have gone out of India graduated from. Uh, Caribbean or a China or any of those countries. Central Asian countries. Wherever, they can practice in other parts of the world. And when they appear for the entrance exam in India, the pass rate is extremely, extremely small. Uh, so I don't want to get into the details about whether quality of education is poor, but we have to ask the question, why this many kids are going out of India to become doctors? If they are going out of India to become doctors, why can't we provide them the opportunity to become their our own kids, right? Why? Right. Because if you do that, the value of the medical education cost will go down significantly. Because if uh, you, is, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, no, 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 please, so friend, friend, please complete your thought. Essentially, it's a demand and supply. As you have more number of medical seats, the value will go down. So you have to maintain that shortage. Right. Uh, Dr. Srinivas, uh, is there a, a question for you? Uh, do you, uh, is there a place uh, for artificial uh, intelligence um, in, uh, in in sort of addressing outbreaks like what we are uh, going through at present? And second, uh, why is it that we cannot manufacture our own uh, PPEs or testing kits or uh, So I'd actually like to respond to the, the previous question briefly and, then, right and then to this. 
No, I think there's a sort of a interesting misunderstanding about the current crisis. On the one hand, of course, it's infectious diseases. There are very particular things to take care of. But I think the point has correctly been made, which is that in any um, crisis associated with healthcare, there's a range of skills that are required, and there's a range of equipment, industry capabilities, and other things that kick in. In a way, the COVID crisis is an interesting one because countries like ours, which have had many large parts moving, including its health industry, some parts of the system that are working or not, is still showing us that we have a perhaps a fundamental misunderstanding that these health crises and health governance is largely a biomedical question. I would actually suggest and perhaps a lot of our medical colleagues will disagree, but I think Dr. Shetty will not, which is in the industrial system in which healthcare is currently situated, there is a fundamental mismatch between what is required, the skills at different levels that are needed, and the kinds of investments that need to play out. If this were any other industry, it would have rapidly gone obsolete because it would have been punished in all kinds of ways. But it is not. It is a very particular kind of industry in which a much more systemic understanding of prevention is required. In fact, if we think that paramedical staff, nursing professions, and all the rest are in fact the bulk of our future investments, then diagnostic kits, vaccines, uh, ventilators, and so on can be matched. I think Dr. Shetty is correct that this mismatch really needs to be brought out because from the WHO standpoint, it is as if health governance is inching along in the absence of a discussion of the industrial organization of the health system. And biomedical expertise is one part of it. There are many other pieces to it, including manufacturing, including testing, certification, accreditation, movement of personnel, under the multilateral agreements and accreditation, even when we do telemedicine. The person who reads and who is accredited to read uh, an x-ray is bound by how they are accredited and what the arrangement is. So the limits of the multilateral framework can only be extended as far as we agree that the industrial organization and its limits of healthcare lie at the center. So specifically around AI, AI is an opportunity, of course it is, but it will be structured within that. Right. Um, uh, Ambassador Puri, I'd like to come back to you. Um, China did not take, or rather it is now relatively understood that China did not uh, tell the world what it was going through, which uh, had implications for the outbreak of this particular pandemic. Uh, the question is, uh, if it was another country, what would have? What do you think would have happened? And second, uh, th this is a question to any of the panelists, uh, uh, Dr. Shetty or uh, Dr. Shrinivas. Uh, how important? is data. Dr. Shetty, you mentioned, uh, you talked about uh, the complete uh, lack of information about the number of gynecologists, the number of pediatricians, the number of anesthetists in, in a country, certainly India. Uh, but on, uh, on other levels, how important is this data for uh, the global health um, institution and where uh, and what do we do with such data? How do we use such data uh, to further a global health agenda? Uh, and a related question is, how important is it for the world to know the origin of the virus that we are currently battling? Is it important to know whether it was, whether it came from a wet market, uh, whether there was a patient zero, who the patient zero, and why uh, what happened happened. Is it important to know that or should we just forget that and move on? Uh, so to any of the panelists who would like to 
uh, address this question. Uh, Manjeev, would you like to take your first one? Just on the small question of, would it be in someone else? 2009, yeah. 2010, the swine flu epidemic generally believed that it started from Mexico. 12,500 died in the United States. Has anybody talked about it? No. So let's understand that there is global politics at play here. Let's not fudge that. Would anybody have said that the Mexicans had the DGWHO at that time, a lady from Hong Kong, China under her thumb? No, 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 no. So, you know, that's part of the game. That's why I said that while all the other things which are being talked about, which are essentially in the realm of domestic capability and India's ability to be able to act as at least the fifth largest country, one sixth of humankind is a completely different ball game and nothing is more important than that. But playing the little game at the multilateral body is a slightly different ball game. So, yes, I hope I've answered right. your question. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shetty, would you like to take uh, the question on the on the data and the virus? You, you're, you're, uh, you're on mute again. You need to unmute yourself. Sure. Didi, it's a, uh, we can spend a lot of time to debate and prove where the virus came from. I, I prefer to just look at, look inward in terms of if an epidemic like this happens again, which will definitely, don't know when, how are we prepared? Are we having enough number of medical specialists in our country, enough nurses, enough hospital beds? We have our own medical equipment to diagnose. Now we can predict next epidemic, what are the things can. There, there are only a few diseases which can be infectious diseases. It's not a mystery. So we can build a scenario of a next epidemic happening and we, assuming we are not as lucky as this time we are, what would be the consequences? How are we prepared? So as far as I am concerned, I am very clear. We buy one of the largest number of medical equipments in the country. And when I wanted to buy a hundred ventilators, no ventilator company from US, Europe or anywhere in the world wanted to sell us equipment. When we wanted to get PPEs and other materials to protect our colleagues, we couldn't, none of them offered. And of course, we are not no different. Even we banned exporting our own PPEs and other things. So if that is the rule of the game, when the chip is down, we have to realize that next epidemic crisis there is no question of we looking for anything outside India. And if we do not prepare ourselves for that eventuality today, then, you know, only the fools repeat the mistakes. Correct. Uh, Dr. Um, Srinivas, yeah, uh, there I is a question for you. I'd like to uh, actually that, respond to the, the, okay. the question, the one in the chat. Yeah. The chat screen. There, okay. there is, yeah, the policy proposals. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. And, and I'd like to actually come back to does it matter? Because I think, uh, Indrani, yes. you've written about this as well. Uh, does it matter what it's called and, and uh, what generated it? Um, you know, at TC Lab, we have a health uh, industry and ecology initiative. Actually, it does matter if it began in a wet market. Uh, if there is, in fact, a kind of a zoonosis element to this, which is quite strong. It's not just COVID. Prior pandemics have had those characteristics as well. And we would be naive, uh, as uh, Ambassador Puri has mentioned, to neither acknowledge where they come from, nor how we might respond appropriately and prevent uh, such situations at home. Now, one of those has to do with the food systems and the relationship of food and health systems together, which have a fascinating, again, separation of food industry versus food systems, health industry versus health systems. And these matter because unless we can articulate what our own goals are for our health systems, we are unlikely to be able to exact those returns from the multilateral system. So I think even for India, some very clear articulation. Affordability is a sideshow. We can make things affordable. However, 
certain amount of preparedness of our own is absolutely essential. So to come back to the policy proposals, one thing I think is absolutely essential, I have worked on it for vaccines, and I think it's really critical in, in a way things proposed 20 years ago are still sitting, which has to do with procurement design. At the end of the day, whether it's the multilateral system or whether it's us, there are going to be mechanisms by which we create markets of a certain kind and provide certain privileges for high priority items. Nobody can define what a high priority item is except us. But once defined and once agreed upon and articulated in a certain way, there has to be a mechanism, whether through market signaling or other, in which we absolutely reward companies or other organizations that can provide it for us. In the event that we do not have it at home, and we do not think it's a timeline that we can have it at home, then there's no shame in procuring it overseas. But that requires friends and not a lot of naivete. Uh, so I, I think the way we respond to the WHO is also very much going to be driven by whether we have a clear understanding of whether the rewards and maybe not the rewards for those within our own health industry and health systems can be lined up um, in, in, to the degree that we are clear about the goals. Uh, so there's a quick follow-up question uh, that uh, this is a national emergency and uh, what holds us back in marshalling our technological resources and talents to respond to it, um, uh, which, I, uh, which we may be doing, but uh, Dr. Shetty, would you like to, there's a couple more uh, questions for you, uh, whether you think that uh, instead of the lockdown option, uh, should we have gone in for the herd immunity uh, option and uh, 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 a slightly unrelated question, uh, but it's uh, again addressed to you, Dr. Shetty. How much does the revivalist upsurge against the scientific spirit and temper in India worry you in the context of the current pandemic uh, with more to come due to our unsustainable lifestyle? The uh uh, first of all, whether we should have left uh, the power of herd immunity to protect us. There is a tip, standard example. Look at England. What happened in England? Uh, the, we simply can't afford to expose our people uh, for that uh, kind of assault from this epidemic. So the, uh, it was okay. I, I wouldn't say it is okay. The entire health system is paralyzed in England mm -hmm. and a uh, lot of needless deaths could have been prevented if they went for an early lockdown like us. There is no doubt about it. And uh, the Prime Minister himself made a statement that, okay, this is the infectious diseases, herd immunity will uh, uh, develop, but for the herd immunity to develop, at least half the country's population should be infected. Now, if you are waiting for half the country's population to be infected, you can just imagine India too, I wouldn't say we could afford to do that, but we can't, even we can't afford to do it. But to some extent, you see the average age of Indian is hardly 26.5 or 26.8, whereas European is 46 point or odd. So the essentially we are a young nation. Obviously, the mortality in India will be significantly less than those countries. Having said that, a country like India also can't afford because we have, even though our age is less, we have very high incidence of comorbidity like oh. diabetes and hypertension, which again compounds the uh, problem of morbidity and mortality. So there is no debate. There are very clear examples of herd immunity is not the option. Now, by going in for a lockdown, will you reduce the number of patients getting infected? May not, we may not over a period of one year or two years span. But we would have prevented overwhelming of the health system where patients die on the corridor of the hospital and doctors are forced to decide on who should be saved and who should be allowed to die. So fortunately, we are not in that position. 
about Indian industry entrepreneurship coming up with equipments and uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, save the uh, society. Uh, we have amazing uh, talent pool of people, entrepreneurs, but you have to realize that uh, uh, healthcare industry is a very difficult animal to try. I'll give an example. You have seen hundreds of startups producing ventilators. Even best of times, ventilators are a dangerous machine. Yeah. In a ICU, we have hundreds of ICU beds in our health city. Now, we try to buy only one type of ventilator. The reason is nurses know exactly how to interpret when that machine misbehaves or behaves in an odd manner. So they know if you change one company ventilator design to another company des design, believe me, somebody is going to be uh, hurt till they all get used to that ventilator. It's a very, very sensitive machine because all it has to do is to malfunction for just two minutes and you have someone brain dead. So when you have a ICU filled with COVID patient and you have a new machine which hasn't been proven yet and ICU is managed by doctors, normally when we manage the ICU, we are only taking care of patient's life. Here, the doctors are first trying to protect their life, then the patient's life. So we want to touch and do as less as possible. There are many standard things which are done on COVID pay on patients who are having a similar problem like COVID, but not COVID. There are many things we do. But in India, in Europe, uh, sorry, in US and Europe, they don't do it because of the risk to the medical staff members, the healthcare workers. So it is a different environment altogether. Trying out anything new in that place, believe me, is not going to be uh, the, the ideal solution. Yeah. Good point. Uh, if I may uh, put the last set of questions to the three panelists uh, from each of you, uh, one suggestion of reform of the global health uh, institutions or the global health system uh, that we can take forward uh, in as a result of this today's debate. Uh, so Manjeet, would you like to go first? I am uh, very clear in my mind. We need to use this to further our own place. I would say in the first place, we should try and see if we can help organize a massive international center which works on vaccines and other preventive things, something like the CTIAR of agriculture. And secondly, get rid of this idea of depoliticization and in fact have a standing World Health Council at the, uh, at the WHO where there's a standing body which takes decisions and which can mandate and force the di Director General to A, take action and alert all the world. To it. Thank you, Manjeev. Uh, Dr. Shetty? I have only one question or a one suggestion. It's not about COVID, about it is the healthcare delivery of the nation. The question is, the suggestion is the government is a custodian of healthcare, not the medical council or the doctors. Government should ask the organization called Medical Council or a National Medical Commission. One question, how many doctors we need, how many specialists we need, how many anesthetists we need for a country of 1.3 billion population, how many we need. Then come up with a system to produce them in three years, not 20 years, 10 years, in three years. And if you cannot, you tell us where do we get them from? Can we get them from China or Bangladesh or wherever? Open the door, let the doctors from other countries come. Either we produce our own doctors or we let the Cuban or whichever doctors want to come in, we let them in. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Srinivas. I'll, I'll begin with the national scenario, which is actually very close to what Dr. Shetty is suggesting which is I do think from the industrial organization side of healthcare, we need a, a sort of an executive decision-making body 
that really looks at something much more dynamic about whether or not we are optimized for the situation on the ground. It's quite straightforward and it's not COVID specific. The second, which is on the multilateral end, is really we must have some kind of executive standing body, uh, similar to what Ambassador Puri is suggesting, where we are a core member, if not a leader. And this is not only because we are already supplier to the world in all kinds of critical uh, capacity issues on the health side, but we also play that role in other industries, including for energy with the Solar Alliance. We play critical roles in food. We play critical roles in other domains. So I think from an industrial organization and technological capability standpoint, that time has long passed where India plays that role. And I think it is absolutely imperative in the reform of the WHO that the industrial basis of healthcare is fully represented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to uh, close the uh, discussion right now. There is uh, one question which is addressed to me, uh, which, uh, uh, which says, why has, uh, what has prevented China from a massive assistance diplomacy among smaller South Asian countries? Uh, is it because of the region's low fatalities or uh, is China already in, uh, engaged internally? Um, uh, well, I, uh, China has actually, I think, uh, uh, sent, they've looked at their assistance program in terms of sending uh, kits, safe testing kits, um, PPEs, etc., to smaller countries. Uh, I can, I know that certainly that they've sent to Sri Lanka, uh, some to Nepal, uh, definitely to Pakistan, where they've also sent uh, a medical team. Um, so they are actually engaged in all of these countries. If you're talking of India, I think, uh, I don't think actually that's necessary because I think we, um, our, de our determination is that we would be able to uh, handle this crisis by ourselves. Uh, may I now turn it over to uh, Priyanka and for her closing remarks. And thank you all for being uh, such a great audience. And thank you very much to the panel. On behalf of the Indian Council of World Affairs, I would like to thank all the panelists and moderator for taking time out of the packed schedule and joining us for this webinar. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to all the participants who have joined in the in their live afternoon from different parts of the country. The webinar would not have been possible without the valuable guidance and support of ICWS Director General, Dr. T.C. Raghavan. I would also like to thank the ICWA Deputy Director General, Mr. Shomen Bakchi, Joint Secretary, Ms. Nutan Kapoor, ICWA Director Research, Dr. Nivedita Ray, and ICWA faculty. My sincere thanks to the colleagues from IT and seminar section who ensured the smooth running of the webinar. I would now like to uh, close my uh, remarks and announce the end of the webinar. Thank you once again for joining us. Stay home, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.